Magandang umaga po sa lahat ng criminology students in various regions in the, in the Visayas, Mindanao, and Luzon. Sa lahat po ng mga reviewers who will be taking the criminology licensure examination, usually again, ang pinakamadugo na mga tanong or questions usually came out from criminal sociology major area. Among the six major areas in criminology based on the confessions, and testimonies of criminology takers and those persons who passed in the CLA and those persons also who failed or who flunked in the board exam. Their confession stated that in criminal sociology, they encountered a lot of the difficult questions because most of the questions that came out in that major area were usually from criminological research and statistics. In the first episode, I talked about, I discussed about preliminary topics relative to research. The definition of research, the application of research in the criminology context. At the same time, I discussed about the various classification of researches according to various categories. I also discussed in the first episode about various fallacies being committed as well as the difference between deductive and inductive reasoning and also on cross-sectional and longitudinal studies. Now, in this last and second episode, we will again be concentrating, okay? We will only be concentrating on two types of researches according to statistical method being used. Number one is quantitative. Number two is qualitative. Now, I would like again to invite the criminology reviewers and the criminology cadets studying right now to please understand the discussion by heart. Let us religiously focus on this discussion because this is really very significant in the taking of the board examination. Who knows when you take the criminology, uh, criminal sociology major area, this discussion might help you. So I hope you will religiously pay attention to the discussion. Now, we will go first on uh, reviewing what is quantitative and what is qualitative research. Based on the first episode, I told you that quantitative uses statistical methods. This is statistical, this refers to numbers. So if the researcher used numbers in his interpretation with the data, for example, he used simple percentage or he used chi-square or whatever statistical method, such research can be called as quantitative research but if the researcher do not does not utilize numbers or statistics in the interpretation of the data such research can be classified as qualitative so in quantitative research we have three types survey secondary data analysis and experimental in qualitative research, we have five. Lima lang po yan. Number one, narrative or narratology, phenomenology, grounded theory, case analysis, and ethnography. So, we will learn these researches or we will learn this, uh, this type of researches as we go along the way. So, we will start with quantitative research. So, ang pinakauna po na type under quantitative research is again, survey. Okay? Survey research. So, in survey research, you collect data from a sample of a population by asking questions. Okay? In order to describe some characteristics of that population. For example, you want to find out the level of effectiveness of a uh, foot patrol. Okay? You conduct a survey. You get a document, you write the indicators there, you, 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 you float the document to the public. In that case, what you are doing is 
survey research. You want to determine whether the criminologist professors are effective the way they teach inside the classroom. You, what you are doing is a survey research. Evaluation research, as what we mentioned in episode 1, is also a survey research. Like you want to evaluate the, the classroom management okay, of a particular person or instructor or a teacher. That research is what we call again as a survey research under quantitative research design. In survey research, what you do is you are the one who collect personally the data, okay? Survey research. But in secondary data analysis, there's no need for you to personally, you know, or directly gather the data from the respondents. But rather, you utilize the data which are already collected or already gathered by various institutions or organizations. For example, like say, you want to conduct a trend studies on the uh, crime victimization in Domaguete City, Negros Oriental. You want to find out the victimization rate in Domaguete City. And you want to find out whether there is an increase or decrease of victimization of a particular year. In that case, you can take a look at the Philippine National Police Headquarters Crime Report. So you do not have to get it, you, uh, you do not have to uh, flaunt a questionnaire yourself, but all you have to do is to gather to collect the data which was already collected by the way, which is already collected by the organization itself. So so what, what you need is to simply go to the police station, get the crime rate of that particular year, and compare it to the other year. We call it, uh, we call it as secondary data analysis. Now, the third type of quantitative research, which was also discussed in the first episode, is experimental research. So again, in experimental research, as what we learned, sa ating nalalaman in the first episode, this includes the introduction of a stimulus or a stimuli. Okay? So, it investigates whether an independent variable produces an effect on another variable by manipulating the independent variable. So again, like say for example, uh, an alcoholic uh, individuals are mixed to a person who is non-alcoholic and you want to find out whether the non-alcoholic guy after a span of a period will adapt the same behavior. So in that case, what you are doing is what we call as experimental research. The example that you can see on the screen is police patrol. Okay? Police patrol. You want to find out whether police patrol will have effect on the rate of homicide in a certain community. So, let us say, if the homicide rate in a certain community, let us say, is 1,000 per month. So, you introduce police patrol in that community and you want to find out whether the police patrol will have effect on the homicide rate. So after a lapse of a period, you gather data and you want to find out whether there is an increase or possible decrease of homicide rate because you introduced a method which is police patrol. So that is what we call as experimental type of research. So those are the three types of researches under quantitative research. Now, let us move now to qualitative type of researches. We have five. We will start with narrat narratology. Okay? When you say narratology, this refers to qualitative method that explores the life of an individual or individuals through interviews and collection of documents. This type of research tells the story of one or more individual's life. In criminological research, criminal justice actors are often given chance to tell their stories using their own perspectives. For example, you interview a serial killer. In that interview, you want the serial killer to tell his personal story the moment he was born his childhood experiences, the manner he was raised to the point that he committed the crime, 
going to the point that he was incarcerated. So in that case, you are doing narratology or narrative type of research. Biography. Take note in the board exam. If the question will ask you, what type of research is biography? Biography is when you write about the life of a person, the time he was born, when he was born, the, his childhood experiences, he, the names of his parents, his siblings, all of this until he died. For example, the biography of President Ferdinand Marcos. Okay? Biography is an example of narratology or narrative type of research. So again, in the board examination, cadets and reviewers, if you see the word story, okay, the research that tells story, if you see the word story, story is associated with narratology, okay? If narratology or if story is associated with narratology, experiences, okay, from the word experiences is also related to the research study which is known as phenomenology. So, may na gani, pag, pag ang nakalagay sa question sa board exam is lived experiences. Ah, the answer should be phenomenology. If the question asks about stories, personal stories, the answer would be narratology. Lived experiences, phenomenology. So, in phenomenology, you study the experiences of a particular phenomenon and you get the essence. What is the essence? You tend to find interpretation. What is the hermeneutics of that experiences? So, phenomenology, you conduct um, an interview according to Criswell. You can limit it from 5 to 25 respondents. But then again, the number of respondents will have to be dependent on what we call as Data saturation. Ano po bang ibig sabihin ng data saturation? Ang ibig sabihin ng data saturation is when the themes or the answers are kept on repeating. For example, the fifth respondent would say that the cause of why he takes drugs is per pressure. On the sixth participant, he tells you the same answer. On the seventh participant, he tells you the same answer. In that case, data has already been saturated. Puno na po. Okay? Puno na lahat. So, we call it as data saturation. So, if the data will saturate at 17, then you have to stop your interview on the 17th participant. But if the data will, will stop at 25, then you have to stop. Uh, if the data will saturate at 25, then you have to stop at the 25. So, again, when we say lived experiences, you study the lived experiences, we call it as phenomenology. You study the stories of a particular individual or individuals, you call it as narratology. Now, another type of qualitative research is what we call as grounded theory. Now, ang pinagkaiba po ng grounded theory from phenomenology and uh, narratology is that in grounded theory, your intention is to develop a theory. Okay? You develop a theory based on the data you gathered through interviews. Okay? Like you interview 20 to 60 individuals and after interviewing, you make a theory based on the findings that you got from the interview. In that case, grounded theory po ang tawag. Again, we will, we will go back. When we say narratology, it studies about, it studies about, you know, the story of the individuals. Phenomenology, lived experiences. Grounded theory, you want to develop a theory based on based on the data you gathered through interviews. Okay? The last, uh, the second to the last one is ethnography. Now, ethnography on the other hand is different from the previous qualitative researches. Because in here, when we say ethno, ethno, when we say ethno, that refers to the culture or an ethnic group. Okay? So, if you want to find out the culture of a group, for example, you want to study the practices of the ETA, what you are doing, or what you will be doing is what we call as ethnography. You want to find out the practices, 
cultures of police officers. Uh, what you are doing is ethnography. But take note that ethnography uses longitudinal studies or lingu- longitudinal way of collecting the data. Because again, in in the first episode, I mentioned about longitudinal studies. Longitudinal studies take a lot of time. So in ethnography, you have to be there at a particular group for around one year, two years, three years, four years, even ten years. Like you stay with them, you reside with them, and you tend to write their practices based on what you see. Okay? You tend to write about their culture based on what you what you see while you are living with a particular group. So you want to determine the culture of prisoners. So you have to live with the prisoners inside the jail. And you write, you make a write-ups about the culture or the practices of these prisoners. So what you are doing is ethnography. Again, from the word ethno, I'm referring to ethnic group or a particular culture of a certain group. Now, the last type of qualitative research is we call as case analysis okay now what is case analysis a qualitative inquiry on the issue or problem by conducting an in-depth analysis on the individual's event program or activity so the program or the event or the activity will refer to as cases similar to other qualitative research methods case study researchers use extensive observation interviews and documentary analysis on a case or cases for example you want to find out the various problems encountered in the conduct of foot patrol so what is the program the program that you want to analyze would be the conduct of foot patrol so you conduct interview you analyze the documentary evidences you observe the conduct of the foot patrol you make findings you you analyze the data and you draw out your findings we call it as case analysis so meaning there is a case that you want to study in that in this scenario the case would be an event a program or an activity so again let us review the five types of qualitative narratology story of the individual phenomenology lived experiences grounded theory you want to create okay create a theory ethnography you study a group or the culture of an ethnic group or a group of people case study you want to analyze a particular case the case might be an event program or activity those are the differences between the different uh, uh, different types of qualitative researches. Now, let us go now to research hypothesis. So, this is also very common to those persons who already graduated okay, from the criminology program. So, research hypothesis is basically a prediction of the possible outcomes of a study. In other words, a hypothesis a hypothesis is a tentative answer to a research question for example do, this is the question do children who have more delinquent purse commit more delinquent acts than children who have fewer or no delinquent peers research hypothesis children who have more delinquent purse tend to com- commit more delinquent acts than children who have no or fewer delinquent pairs. So when you say hypothesis, you tend to predict the outcome of the study. Okay, you want to make a guess. Okay, hypothesis is simply a guess or a tentative answer to a specific research question. Now, a hypothesis can be null hypothesis. On summoning null hypothesis, when you say null hypothesis. This usually refers to the absence of relationship between two variables. Okay? For example, is there a relationship between job satisfaction and academic performance? Your null hypothesis would be there is no significant relationship between the two. Oh, null hypothesis. Is there, a, is there a relationship between the level of 
implementation of foot patrol and the crime rate and your null hypothesis would say there is no significant relationship between the implementation of foot patrol and crime rate so null hypothesis ang tawag po dyan so again pag nakalagay po no significant relationship put in mind you call it as null hypothesis now the next one is research variables okay so in episode 1 i mentioned about this and we will study this one for us to really understand the differences between the two now when we say variable this is something that varies when you say something that varies something that will undergo changes it is not statutory but rather this usually uh, uh, goes to uh, undergoes change now research variables can also be considered as a concept a noun that stands for variation with a class of objects gender self-control and crime are variables because they vary across subcategories these subcategories are called attributes for example sex usually varies or changes it could be a male it could be a female same as age same as college year level you cannot say that college year level is only one there is usually one two three and four iq will vary self-control level will vary number of crimes will vary we call this one as variables why because they vary the changes uh, from one category to the other now in the study of research variable cadets there are things that we have to remember according to the types okay now in the types of variables we have to put in mind that there are only four okay so research variables contain only four types number one is nominal variable i'm not yet talking about independent and dependent or moderating i'm talking about types of research variables focus muna po tayo sa nominal variable now nominal variables i'm sure this will come out in the board exam comprise variables whose attributes differ but have the rank order attributes ah, what is an attribute again this refers to this refers to cut subcategories for example imong variable yung variable mo is sex what would be the attribute it would be male or female your variable is um college uh, or tertiary college tertiary level or college year level your attributes would be first year second year third year or fourth year so in nominal variables their attributes differ pero wala sila pong rank order for example gender attributes will vary male and female but you do not say that male is more superior than female you do not say that national according to nationality filipinos are more superior than australians and canadians so male and female persons differ but have no rank no rank so basically their attributes may differ but there is no rank order so no rank order meaning there is no first there is no second they are equal with each other the second one is ordinal variables when you say ordinal variables this comprise variables whose attributes differ na mayroon po silang ranks but no distance no distance for example college year level what are your attributes in college year level first year second year third year fourth year so basically these are your attributes that that differ now in 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 college year level you can also see the rank unlike Unlike in nominal variable like gender, there is no rank between male and female because male and female are actually equal. But in here, in the college year level, there is rank simply because first year is lower compared to second. Third year is much higher compared to second year. So there is differences as to the attributes. There is also rank. 
but there is no there is no distance okay why there is no distance because we cannot really say how many subjects the first year have compared to the second year or in comparison to the third year and in comparison to the fourth year so basing on the number of subjects you cannot say okay you cannot say that first year has has lower subjects compared to the second year therefore there is no distance they may have rank because first year is lower than second year but there have no distance now the third one is what we call as interval variables this comprises of variables whose attributes differ have ranks and distance but have no absolute zero point take note of the statement no absolute zero point this is something that differs from the other types of research variables so for example let us take a look on iq let us read the the, the example on the screen in terms of iq a person with 50 iq differs from a person with 100 iq so 100 iq is higher than 50 iq 100 IQ is 50 more than 50 IQ because of the ranks. But you cannot say that 100 IQ is twice as large as 50 IQ. Why? Because there is no absolute zero. There is no absolute zero point. So basically, you do not say that this person with 100 IQ, he is more, uh, he is dub, uh, he is two times wiser compared to the person who is having the 50 IQ only because there is no such thing as absolute zero. Now, for us to understand, when you say zero degrees Celsius, it does not really mean that there is no hotness or coldness. There is even a temperature which is negative one, negative two. So when you say zero, negative, uh, zero degrees Celsius, it does not mean that there is no hotness. Or it does not refer to uh, the absence of coldness. It is just zero degrees Celsius. In that case, there is a, there is a, there is no absolute zero value. There is no absolute zero point, as as stated on the example. So zero again, zero point, uh, zero degrees Celsius does not really mean that there is no hotness. So so in this case. The zero has no absolute, absolute, uh, in this case, the zero degrees Celsius have no absolute zero point. The last one is ratio variables, which comprise variables whose attributes differ, have ranks, distance, and absolute zero point. This is in comparison to the first, or to the third, which is interval variable. If interval variable has no absolute zero point this one has really an absolute zero point i put an example on your screen for example age 0 1 5 10 30 years old number of crimes committed 0 1 2 3 4 monthly income 1 to 100 to 100,000 these variables possess all the qualities of the three preceding variables plus an absolute zero point can you my absolute zero point because zero mean that the the person uh, uh, that the person is not yet born one means that it was yet it was the first day of the person who is it was the first day for the person to be born 10 simply because the person is 10 days old 30 because the person is 30 years old so basically the zero here has absolute value or absolute zero point the zero crime rate means that, that there is an absence there is an absence of crime. So when you say zero crime rate, there is an absence of crime. But when you say zero degrees Celsius, you do not mean that there is absence of coldness or hotness. See the point? So when you say zero degrees Celsius, it does not mean that there is an absence of coldness or there is an absence of hotness. So therefore, the zero degrees Celsius has no absolute zero point. In that case, such shall be considered as interval variable. But in ratio variable, yung zero crime rate Meaning, my absence po ng crime in. Absence of crime po. So when your income is zero, meaning there is an absence of 
income, wala pong income, zero. So, ang zero po dyan, may, may value, may absolute zero point. Unlike in degrees Celsius na zero nga, na wala po tayong absolute zero point. That's the difference between ratio and interval variables. Now, let us go now to the typology of variables. I'm referring to the relationship between one variable to the other. This could be independent variable and ang pangalawa is dependent variable. So, you see independent variable, this is a variable that can stand alone. Or that is a variable expected that is expected to affect the dependent variable. Well, the dependent variable is the variable that is affected. So, the one who is expected to affect is the independent. But the one who is affected or is being influenced is considered as the dependent variable. So, in other words, dependent variable behaves like a cause and effect. The cause is the independent and the effect would be the, the dependent variable. For example, Independent variable is educational attainment. So, educational attainment could affect, the effect of educational attainment could be um, law abiding, professionalism, um, integrity. So, integrity, um, integrity being law abiding are the effects of educational attainment. So, in this case, the educational attainment is independent variable while the being law-abiding, professionalism, integrity are considered as dependent variable because these are merely the effects of educational attainment. Another example, let us say gender or sex between male and female and uh, consider it as an independent variable. The dependent variable would be... Um, um, crimes. So, between the male and the female, there's a big, between gender, there's a big possibility that it has relationship with, with, with crime. That between the two, male is considered to be more prone to commit criminality. So, that can be considered as examples of what we call as independent and dependent variable. Last example, per pressure. Per pressure can be an independent variable. What would be the effects of per pressure? It could be a probability to commit crime, misconduct, law violation. So, law violation, misconduct, blah, blah, blah are all examples of what we call as effects. So, therefore, it is these are considered as dependent variables. So, those are the differences between dependent and independent variable. Now, imagine that uh, you want to drink a coffee, alright? You want the coffee uh, in the cup or inside the cup. When you get a, teas a teaspoon and you submerge the teaspoon and you, you pick or you get um, an ounce of coffee from your glass and you taste it, the ounce of coffee on top of the teaspoon is an example of what we call as a sampling. Okay? A sampling or a sample out from the general population. The general population is the coffee inside the cup while the coffee on top of the teaspoon that you sip is an example of what we call as sampling. So, we have to make sure that the sample is enough to represent the whole population. If the sampling is not enough to represent the whole population, what happens is the findings of the research cannot be generalizable, cannot be generalized to the whole population. As what we discussed in the episode 1 about agiographic and nomotheric, if a particular case or if a particular research only studies one case or one instance only. Like what we discussed in episode one is on the case of Lomen, who is a um, who is a victim of of who is a battered wife. Okay, who is a battered wife. The researcher only focused Lomen as the only participant. In that case, the findings from the study cannot be applicable to other individuals, but only applicable to Lomen. 
Okay? Lawmen as the only participant of the study. Well, when we say nomothetic, ibig sabihin, marami ka po, marami po kayong sample. The sample is enough to represent the whole population. So, the, the result of the study or the result of the research would be generalizable to to the whole population. So, if you if you um, collected or if you have, let us say, 3,000 samples or 4,000 samples that represent battered women, the findings could be something that could be applicable to those persons or to those women suffering from, fra, suffering from physical injuries against their husband. Or if you have 5,000 or 6,000 population or sampling, that would be enough to represent the whole people or the whole population in the Philippines who are suffering from physical injuries from their husband. So again, a geographic, one instance only, one sample only, that cannot be generalized to the whole population. Now we have two types of sampling method. Number one is probability. Number two is non-probability. Now, in probability sampling, this gives equal opportunity or chance to every individual to be included in the study. But in non-probability sampling, this is opposite to probability because you do not give equal chance to every individual to become a sample or become a representative uh, uh, on a particular study. For example, you want to pick those persons who only have lived experiences on bullying. So you want to pick up only those individuals. You have a criteria set that these are the only persons and you select them based on your criteria. What you are doing is non-probability sampling. You only select those persons whom you, you, whom you know who suffered bullying. We call that one as non-probability sampling because it does not give opportunity for other persons who are also victims of bullying to be part of your study. But in probability sampling, you give chances to everyone to be part of your research. So we call it as probability. But in again, non-probability, you do not give chance to others to become a member or become part as research participants in your research study. Now, probability sampling consists of various methods. One of these is simple random sampling. Take note of these cadets because this may come out in the board exam. So this is the simplest probability sampling method. We have many methods of probability sampling, but uh, uh, this is the simplest one. What you, what you need would be um, a list of... Uh, let us say, if, you're, if your participants are police officers, then you have to have a list of police officers. And of course, you need to have a random numbers table. A random numbers table can be downloaded online. Marami po tayong uh, uh, sources na may random numbers table. Like you will just search it at Google, right? at the internet, automatically it will pop out. So what you can see in the screen po, is an example of a table of random digits that can be downloaded online. So, example, assume that we need to survey 800 police officers out of all 10,000 police officers in Region 7. So, this means that out of 10,000, we only need to get how many? 800. Yan lang po ang kailangan natin as respondents of the study. So, we can do simple random sampling by maybe you have a, a, a Philippine paper money bill. Like if you have 20 pesos, for example. If you do not have the bill, then possibly you get a book, anything that have serial numbers. So, based on the 20 pesos bill serial number, you can see that the first digit is 6, okay? The first digit is 6, followed by the 8, and the last digit is 1. So in simple random sampling, in order to perform this one, you just have to simply take notice on the first digit, which is 6. The 6 would signify 
that the area that you have or the division that you have to consider in the selection would be the sixth division. So you have to count. If you already downloaded the table, uh, table of random digits, you have to count. This is one, two, three, four, five, six. So you have to start with in the six within the sixth column. Why? Because your first serial number is six. Now take note that out uh, that the total population is ten thousand. Okay. So what you are going to select would be the number that will correspond within 10,000. Because if the number that you get is beyond 10,000 and your population is already is only 10,000, in that case, um, that would be very impractical for you to get the correct participant or this one, considering that there is no 11,000 participant. You only have 10,000. So in this case, you got 54,876. 54, this may signify for 54,876. Question, do you have 54,876 in your list? The answer is no. Why? Because in your list, you only have the names, the first name, up to the 10,000 name of the individual. So there is no 54. Second would be 24,037, signifying 24,037. Again, this will not qualify because you only have 10,000 in your list. The next and the third is 02560. That will be uh, interpreted as 2,560. Question, is 2,560 within 10,000? The answer is yes. So the name that is listed on the 2,560, di ba may number, di ba may number, Kayong naka-assign per name. Like say for example, first name, Juan de la Cruz. Second name, Pedro. Third name, Tomas. So let us say that 2,568 name is Maria. So Maria will, be the, will become the first respondent. Then you go along. Again, 36,000 is not within 10,000. 42 is not within. 74,818 still again not within 10,000. It is beyond rather. Um, as you go along, we have here 8,928, which is within 10,000. So you have to pick up the name that belongs to 8,928, and that will be your second respondent. Then you also have below 210. So the name within the 210 order will be the third respondent. Again, you will do this until you will reach your desired quota, which is 800 respondents. We call this one as simple random sampling. Second probability sampling method is what we call as systematic sampling, which is quite, you know, an alternative to simple random sampling. This is also known as pseudo random selection. So, an example, this is very easy actually. This is very easy. All you have to do is to get a is to get a, is to get a number one a list of for example if your respondents are police officers then you have to get the list of officers if the total population is 10000 and your and your target is to get 1000 from that total population then you divide 10000 divided by 1000 and that is that will result to 10 so 10 meaning the 10 in here would mean the interval the interval that you have to yeah that you have to use now in the systematic sampling it involves that you download again the table of random digits okay so that is why this is a pseudo random sampling simply because it adapts the principle of simple random sampling why because you need to download again that table of random digits and uh, again you have to take a look for example on serial numbers and uh, based on our example in simple random sampling a while ago you have to start at the sixth column when you start at the sixth column the first number is five four eight seven six the first figure or the first number uh, is five so, since the first number is 5, 
in this case, you have to start on the fifth name. Okay, on the fifth order. And that will be your first respondent. Once you start with the fifth as your first respondent, mag-interval na po kayo ng 10. So, 5 plus 10 is 15. So, the name in the 15th number is the second uh, respondent. Then, 15 plus 10, uh, the 20, 25. So, the 25th uh, name, 25th name will be the third respondent. And you do this until you will reach 1,000 because your target is 1,000 participants. On the other hand, we have the third uh, probability sampling method known as stratified sampling. The purpose of this one is to achieve variance between and homogeneity within a strata or within a group, for example. If, if you are talking about police officers, na maging respondents mo in the research study and among the population 30% are senior police officers that means in your sample size in your total sample size 30% of it should be senior police officers another example let us say you will be getting 100 participants out of 1,000 student criminology population for example in the total population you have 1000 let us just say 300 of these are first year which constitute 30 percent second year are also 300 which constitute another 30 percent third year criminology students are uh, 200 which is 20 percent of the total population and fourth year is also 20% or 200. In that case, if your sample size is 100 out of the total population, which is 1,000, meaning out of the 100 that you will get as a sample size, 30 of that should be first year. Why? Because 30 would constitute 30% of the 100 sample size. 30, another another 30 will be taken from second year. Why? Second year constitute 300 of the total of the, of the total population, diba? Kay, and 300 is 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 the total population of second year. And your total population from first year to fourth year is 1,000. So you get another 30 percent. So 30 percent of 100 is only 30 because your target is only 100 respondents. Third year should be 20. Why 20 individuals? Because 20, 20 individuals represent 20% of the total population. Another 20% for the fourth year. So meaning, first year, 30. Second year, 30. Third year, nakukuhain mo as participants is also 20. Fourth year is also 20. Total of 100. Your target again is sample size 100. Total population is 1,000. Meaning 100 out of 1,000 na total population. So, sa 1,000 na total population, you will only get 100 as your sample size, comprising of 30 first year, 30 second year, 23rd year, and 24th year. We call it as stratified sampling. The last one is many cluster sampling. This involves, guys, this only, this only be utilized, this can only be utilized if the area or if the population is very large, okay? So, for example, Philippines, you want to take a look on, you know, a study conducted on the, in the entire Philippine archipelago. What you need to do is to divide it into clusters. We call it as multi-clusters sampling. So, example, divide cities, municipalities into cluster of barangays. Divide these barangays into poroks. Then divide it into houses, dwellings in selected poroks, villages, and use simple random sampling to select the dwellings. Upon the survey, randomly select the occupant of the house dwelling who is going to be the respondent of the study. So this is the most complicated and the most difficult one when we cluster, okay? When we cluster a particular population. This usually involves a very large area or a very large population. On the other hand, we also have various methods in non-probability sampling. So again, 
What is the difference between probability and non-probability sampling? In probability, you give chances for others to become a participant or respondent of your study. But in non-probability, you do not give chance. What you do is you are the one who select. Okay? You give chance in probability simply because you do it by random. So anyone can be can be a participant or a respondent. But in non-probability, you just select it based on your criteria or based on your discretion. For example, we have number one, convenience sampling. The researcher selects respondents who are nearest to him or available to him. Thus, affords him with the ease of selecting respondents but at the risk of not achieving representativeness of the sample. Like you only get those who are close to you. Okay? Like for example, if you want to, to take a look on lived experiences of drug surrenderies. So you only get those drug surrenderies who are your neighbors. You do not go to other, other cities or municipalities. We call that one as convenience. Another method of non-probability sampling aside from convenience sampling is what we call as purposive sampling wherein you only get the respondents or participants who are the most knowledgeable or those who have more experiences with a particular phenomenon of interest. So, if your study is about workplace bullying, you only select those participants whom you think are the ones who have experiences on a particular phenomenon of bullying. You do not select other individuals. Meaning, if you believe that this person has experiences of bullying, then you, you select him as your participant. We call that one as purposive sampling. In convenience sampling, the one who is close to you will be your respondent. Purposive, the one whom you think is knowledgeable, those are the individuals whom you think can be your participant or respondents. In snowball sampling, it is similar to purposive sampling. But in snowball sampling, from the word snowball, when the snow will roll, sometimes it becomes bigger and bigger as, as it goes along. So in this case, you select one participant or one respondent, and that one respondent will refer you to the other possible respondent, whom, whom that respondent thinks that, uh, whom that respondent thinks that that person also experienced the same phenomenon. For example, workplace bullying again. So if you have one participant that you selected, for example, you select Juan. When you go to Juan, Juan may refer you to Pedro because Juan may say nga, Pedro also experienced the same workplace bullying. So in that case, after you are done with Juan, you interview Pedro. When you interview Pedro, Pedro refers you to Maria because Pedro knows that Maria also experienced the same. So Maria will be your third participant. When you go to Maria, Maria will refer you again to Tomas because Maria knows that Tomas also experienced the same phenomenon. So in that case, we call it as snowball sampling. So the popular the, the participants becomes bigger and bigger by means of what we call as referral system. So what you can see on your screen right now, an example is a drug trafficker. So you only spot, you only select one drug trafficker and that drug trafficker will pinpoint you to the other drug trafficker. And when you interview the other drug trafficker, he will appoint you or he will pinpoint you again to the other drug trafficker. So your participants become bigger and bigger by referral system. Now, the last one is what we call as quota sampling, which is comparable to stratified sampling method in probability. But rather, the difference is that in quota sampling, it's just a combination of convenience sampling and purposive sampling. Because in quota sampling, what you do is you, you utilize convenience sampling first. For example, you want to study about workplace bullying. 
So you you utilize convenient sampling in here first, meaning you get those individuals who are close, who are near to your location. Once you get those individuals who are close to your to your location, you utilize purposive sampling. You tend to select based on the degree of experience or degree of knowledge on these persons relative to workplace bullying. So if there are, let us say, 200 people who is close to your location, and out of the, these 200 people, you only found out that only 20 of them experience workplace bullying. In that case, you only get that 20. And we call it as quota sampling simply because the people you get are near to you at the same time, you only get those people whom you think are knowledgeable on that particular phenomenon. And what you're doing is a combination of convenience and purposive sampling, basically referring to quota sampling method. Now, the last topic could be statistical method of data analysis. Um, but take note that we will not be delving more on the details on how this test can be performed because uh, number one, this can only be well emphasized if a statistician is, uh, is the one discussing it. At the same time, this will take a lot of um, time for us to discuss the details on how this test can be conducted. Now we have the test. So if you want to difference the you want to calculate the difference between two means, you can use the T test. For example, we want to determine who between male and female US students engage more frequently on bench or beer drinking. In this case, we can utilize the T test. On the other hand, we also have a statistical method known as ANOVA or Analysis of variance, like calculating the difference of means among at least three groups. So in t-test, there are only two groups that you want to find out what is the difference between the two groups, between these two groups. Tawag na t-test. But in analysis of variance, there are three groups that you want to find out the difference between the three. With t-test, we tested the difference between two groups again. Now, what if we want to test the differences among, say, three or four groups? This time, we will use ANOVA to do such comparison. For example, what is the difference among college year levels, first year, second year, third year, and fourth year level in terms of engagement in alcohol drinking? So right now, there are four groups that we are trying to differentiate as to the level of drinking alcohol. So we can use ANOVA. I repeat, in T-test, there are only two groups that we tend to find out in terms of their difference. In ANOVA, it could be three, four, or many more. The next one is chi-square. Now, chi-square is designed to determine the association between two nominal variables. In the example that you can find in your screen, sa makikita nyo po, we tend to determine the association of sex on the membership of fraternities and sororities. So the question would be, what is the association between sex and membership in fraternities? So this question will tell us that the method or the statistical method that we are going to utilize is chi-square. But take note, do not confuse yourself with, oh, of, do not confuse yourself uh, between chi-square with person correlation because chi-square is merely on association, associating one variable to the other. Person correlation is more focused on the relationship between variable to the other variable. So relationship po ang, ang, uh, ang, ang binibigyan ng emphasis in person correlation. For example, is there a relationship between between uh, favorable attitudes towards going to parties and engagement of alcohol drinking? Is there a relationship between favorable attitude towards parties and engagement in, in, in alcohol drinking? All of this. If it talks about relationship, is there a relationship between job satisfaction and and uh, 
outstanding uh, performance in teaching? Is there a relationship between uh, police omnipresence and the uh, decrease of crime rate? This, all of this shall be uh, analyzed through a statistical method known as person correlation, which is different from chi-square as I have said a while ago. The next one and the last is known as the binary logistic regression. Now, in binary logistic regression, this is focused on determining the relationship between a group of predictors or independent variables and a nominal dependent variable. Example, can membership in fraternities or sororities be significantly predicted using age, gender, and attitudes towards athletics, religion, and parties? Example ane or kaning example is under what we call as binary logistic regression. In binary logistic regression again, the question tends to predict, okay, to predict a particular phenomenon. When you tend to say whether when you tend to predict whether membership in sororities could be predicted by age or gender, the best suitable statistical method that you are going to use should be binary logistic regression. So let us review the statistical method of analysis again. T-test, you calculate the difference between two groups. ANOVA, you tend to calculate the difference between three groups, four groups, or five groups, or above. The next one is chi-square. Chi-square, you, you find out the association between one variable to the other. Person correlation, you find out the significant relationship between one variable to the other. The multiple linear regression, you find out whether a particular factor can be predicted by a variable. So those are the difference between statistical method of data analysis cadets and reviewers thank you so much for for um, reviewing with me in the second episode of criminological research and statistics at the bottom portion you can see a comment section you can type your questions in there you can give me a personal personal message for us to discuss about um, things that you do not understand in this discussion i'm really hoping even though criminal sociology is the most madugo na major area in, in the criminology licensure examination, I hope and I pray that this discussion that we are doing right now is something that will weaponize you in taking the board examination so that when you, when you take the board exam, questions relative to research might not be difficult to you, but rather it may become easy for you to answer thank you so much for joining the can for joining the discussion for joining the review and i hope that you will pass the board examination god bless you stay safe and uh, happy learning mm -hmm.